the first time, kind of first, it was my first time even stepping foot in Cambodia. I was born in, in um, a refugee camp and I came here when I was two years old and for a variety of, of legal immigration reasons and personal reasons, I was never actually able to go to Cambodia until um, literally having to appeal and hire a lawyer and then go through this whole process of, of um, getting my passport and then being able to leave safely. So in 2018, I went to Cambodia for the first time and, and that you know, entire trip was this really deeply um, kind of heartfelt journey on my end in terms of discovery of, of a personal and family. Um, just getting a connection to you know this 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 whole half of this world or this space that 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 you know played such a big role in 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 kind of you know my world growing up, but not really having a connection to what that was, not really understanding um, what Cambodia was, and um, and having family members there, um, including my father and siblings that I, I'd never met before. Um, so the residency at, at PPAC was literally, I, I shot everything on a large form of camera and I literally walked that film across the border into Thailand just to be able to get it developed. Um, I had not seen anything, wasn't able to scan anything or actually even see the negatives until I did my residency at PPAC. So that was an incredible, like such a big, big help um, for my practice. Um, just spending that time, having that whole month to be able to scan everything, go through everything, color correct, um, and make some proofs. Um, so yeah, if you are considering applying, if you look at like, it is an amazing, amazing opportunity. And, and it was definitely instrumental um, for my practice. Um, I do want uh, this talk to be more open-ended. So please, um, as I go through the slideshow and talk about these pictures, if there's anything that anyone wants to bring up or if there's a question, please jump in. I don't want this to be one-sided where I'm just talking. Um, we'll try our best to you know, work through the tech and stuff. Um, so I'm gonna start with um, a photograph. Let me see, I'm gonna share my screen, okay. Oh, great. Okay, and sorry, okay. So this is kind of the start of my journey from, this was about 10 years ago. Um, and this is my grandmother. Um, and this portrait was taken, it was literally one of the very first pictures when I just started taking pictures. Um, and I, I took her portrait um, and then I, I found this photograph um, so in the process of making a portrait, I, I interviewed my grandmother for the first time in my life. And I asked her about her experiences during the killing fields and even her life before the war. Um, and through that, I, I discovered this family photograph um, that was taken about 1972, 1973. My, my mother is second to the left, and um, those are my aunts and uncles. Um, everyone there survived other than um, one aunt who is um, in the middle. Um, and they literally buried this photograph um, at their family compound um, when the Khmer Rouge came. Um, and then in the 90s, my, my uncle went back to Cambodia and he retrieved the photograph. So it was literally one of, of two objects that was saved by my family from before the war. So when I, I, I discovered this photograph, it was this really incredible, tangible connection to this, you know, to this story, to this past, to my family that I had never even really understood growing up. Um, uh, so it was really kind of instrumental for me in terms of even feeling or having or looking at this photograph. Um, so that kind of opened up for me this entire like need, kind of existential desire to go and really try to figure out through photography um, what this all means um, for myself and my family and, and, and my community. Um, I wanted to briefly show a, a project that I did for a couple of years um, of uh, workshops installation. So I took this experience with my grandmother and, and I kind of, I, I broke it down in terms of figuring out exactly what the process was, how, you know, interviewing and, and, and asking these specific questions and, and just kind of learning about my family and kind of broke it down to a workshop format um, and did workshops with young Cambodian Americans who are like myself. Um, I consider myself the one and a half generation and also second generation, meaning um, I was born there, but, but I was raised here. Um, and, you know, there's a sense of this intergenerational divide between, between 
my experience as an American and, and of course, and my parents and, and, and family. Um, so we had young people, young Cambodians in, in Philadelphia, Chicago, Long Beach, and Stockton all had really large Cambodian communities. Um, kind of do the exact same thing that I did where they went to their own families and, and they looked for old photographs or ephemera that was a, a tangible connection to, to this past. And they made Polaroids um, of those photographs. So they kind of created ephemera from ephemera itself. Um, and then they learned about, you know, what this meant. And they also traced their family journeys um, from Cambodia to the refugee camps to America. And then they brought that back together. Um, and in, in, you know, in, in terms, in a group setting, kind of created the space for people to share what they learned. And it was kind of amazing in the sense that a lot of these experiences where you feel I felt was unique to my own family, it was shared amongst the entire community. You know, these stories of family separation, of time in the refugee camps, of coming to America. Um, all that was these shared experiences that when you brought people in together, you know, you realize how incredibly important your story is, um, but then also the commonalities that you share with other people. So each one of these Polaroids, there's a piece of string um, and it's colored and each one specific um, is a representation of a single family journey. Um, and at the end of the workshop, the we did an installation. This is in Long Beach um, where the participants mapped their, their family journeys from Cambodia. So Cambodia, the map is about six by six feet on the left side. Um, and then there's a map of the US on, on the right side. And they stood in the middle and they physically mapped through pins and the string and the Polaroids that were attached to, to the string, their, their, their family journey. So it's a physical manifestation of a diaspora. Um, and, and so I, I did this for, for a couple of years and, and you know, doing these workshops and it was incredibly powerful for me. And, um, but then I, I had never done that work myself. Um, I, I, of course, had, had interviewed my grandmother, my parents, and uh, photographed a bit here, but I'd never made the journey to Cambodia specifically. Um, and that, so, so that mapping of family journeys was pretty much the foundation that I used uh, for my own practice when I went to Cambodia in 2018. And I wanted to, so these are, um, this is the, um, the work is called Tentatively, I'm here with you now, um, and, and that for me is this, it comes from this feeling that, um, or this belief that, that, you know, that my family members were killed and um, that I've been separated from her, so that, you know, um, that, that I was physically in the space that they inhabited. I, I looked for specific spots of memory, um, sites of, 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 you know, where family members lived and, and where they worked and multiple, multiple waves of migration. Uh, this photograph um, was taken on the border of Cambodia and Thailand. And, and it's, 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 for me, it's a sense of, so my mother, when I was born, had this vision of, of the here and, and on this border and in the refugee camps, um, had this vision of, of, I'm sorry, before I was born, when, when she was pregnant with me, had this dream um, of being on this mountain and then and, and, and having hundreds and hundreds of women around all digging with their bare hands. Um, and they were looking for a diamond. Um, and then she looked down and she saw that the diamond was underneath her feet. Um, and for her, that was kind of like this really kind of, um, you know, a um, um, like hope for, for the future, hope for, you know, that she was pregnant and, and that she knew that she was coming to America. Um, so yeah, and um, you know, she talks about this dream all the time. This is my, my father. Um, my father, he left when I was 13. He went to, he was resettled in, in the US with my mother um, and I, and they separated when I was in the second grade. Um, he suffered from pretty severe depression. Um, 
he was he really really struggled um with ptsd multiple attempts in his life um and then when i was 13 he literally just 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 left and um i've separated him from for about a little bit over 20 years um so when you know when i i one of the first things that i did was i i found him um and i spent a lot of time with him i reconnected with him um and I tried to make these pictures. And so my dad has a, a very severe form of psoriasis um, and is arthritic. And if you're familiar with that, I mean, so he's not, he can't move for more than a couple of hours. He's, he's mobile for about an hour or two, um, but he has severe pain in, 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 in his joints. Um, so I'm photographing him with a large format camera. And um, if, if you're familiar with that process, it takes a really long time to set up. Um, to get the focus, um, you know, looking through the looking glass with the, with the cut, with the, the dark cloth. Um, so he really had to work with me in terms of making these pictures. And I was really at first kind of worried about whether or not he was even allowing me to, you know, to make these images. But um, he, he seemed to really understand like my deep desire and need um, to be there and to connect and then also to make these photographs of him. This is on his mantle in his living room. And in the center, there's actually me. That's my third grade school portrait. That's the picture, the only photograph that he has of me. And um, when I was a kid, um, he attempted to take his life. And, um, and he had this photograph. He carried it with him um, after that. And he told me about how it reminded him to, you know, gave him kind of um, motivation to, to keep fighting. Um, but so when I saw this photograph on his mantle, you know, and then it, it being tilted down the way it was, and um, it was quite poetic for me, um, very emotional. Um, but um, yeah, just I, I, you know, I that these like uh, that experience, like that, you know, from for me as a kid, I, I mean, I still remember these things very clearly. Um, plays a really big role you know, in, in, in the way that, in what I'm trying to photograph and just the way that I move around the world. And this is, again, this is my father. Um, he's in a, a, a town about two hours from Phnom Penh. Um, And I'm, you know, so I was interested also in in just going to these sites of memory um, on my mother's side and my father's side. So this is the river um, in front of my mother's family compound that she grew up in. Um, this is soil erosion. You can tell from the very that is, you know, I mean, it's at least seven feet or so. Um, those exposed roots. Um, but the Khmer Rouge during the war took over my family's compound. It was the largest in the province and they converted it to a field hospital. Um, and because of that, of course, it was a site of trauma. A lot of people died there. Um, so the locals believe that the house was, was haunted um, and it sat abandoned for, for several decades, actually. This is an offering to my grandmother, whom I'd never met. She passed away before I was able to get there. And um, Cambodians, uh, who are also Chinese, um, on my, my dad's side, there's, there's a little bit of Chinese. And um, this is the thing we do during the Cambodian New Year. And this is my mother's house that, that, that I'd mentioned. And it's, it's quite dilapidated now, you know? So when I was growing up, I had these grand visions, these like ideas of what this house was from the stories that I heard. And, uh, you know, I just imagine it being this, this grand thing. And then you go there and you see, and it's just like this, you know, it's this little house. And um, yeah, it's, it's quite, you know, it was built by my grandfather. This is the front of the house also. And guys, please, if, if, if you have anything that you want to ask, any questions, any comments, please um, raise a hand. Um, Pete, it's yes. Sarah from PPAC. Yes. From the picture before, you were saying that, um, I'm just kind of wondering about the significance of the, not that one, the one before of the, um, of the fire. Um, yes. Yeah, I was just kind of wondering about the significance of that tradition in terms of 
the objects and the fire? Um, Absolutely, yeah. So, yeah, so the idea is you're making an offering. So you're burning a house to provide a house um, to your family members in the afterlife. And what's so kind of amazing for me is that these houses are built, you know, are, are like they're paper houses, right? But they're, um, you know, it's, it says a lot about kind of our expectations or their expectations in Cambodia and in China in terms of what is uh, an appropriate house. The cars are Lexuses, you know, the house looks like big mansions and um, their coach bags and, and things like that. Um, you know, like there's literally, you can see the bars of gold, right? Um, so the idea is you're providing these things. Um, and then there's a lot of food too that, that's, that's um, giving, given as an offering. Um, but every single year, uh, families do this to provide food, money, they burn money, you know, housing and cars, clothes and all that to, to family members in the afterlife. So is your family making the home or is that something? That's something that you buy at the market. Yeah, okay. that's something you buy at the market. They're like $5 or so. Um, and yeah, so they're like little like paper Lexuses and paper coach bags and um, and you know, the fa my family, they're like on my dad's side. So where this is at, they're in a deep rural province. There's, there's nothing else there. It's hours away on Moto to get there. Um, you know, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny little, little village. Um, you know, but these are aspirations also in terms of, of what people want for their own lives and what they want for their family members in the afterlife. Thank you. For me, it's so to be able to participate in it, you know, to be there um, and to make the offerings too for my grandmother, you know, was, was very, very significant. Yeah. When I showed some of these pictures of the house to my family in, in Stockton, you know, they were quite, um, it's, it's, it's hard for them to look at these pictures you know, because they have such, you know, beautiful memories of, of, of growing up there and, and the fact that the house is still there um, and it's in the condition that it's in. For me, you know, it's, 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 it's time passing, right? Um, I think of the, was it the third chapter in Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse, you know, of, of the house just kind of, of over time, just by itself taking on this, this entire kind of, you know, the house as a character. And, um, taking on this, 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 you know, the duration of time, just kind of unfolding. Um, yeah, this is inside the house. This is again all original. The house is still standing there. Um, we tried to. We, we, my wife and I, you know, we, we wanted to to buy it, um, but um, it's owned now by the neighbors who were there before. Who there's no title deeds. Um, there weren't any title deeds before the Khmer Rouge, and then after the, the genocide, everything was kind of, you know, up for grabs, um, so it was no longer um, with, uh, with my family. These are the original tiles, the stairs from, from that house. Um, and, you know, so for photographing on, on a wooden camera, it was my first time ever really, literally, like ever photographing large format wooden camera. Um, and doing this in Cambodia, doing this where it's like 9,500 degrees, 95 percent humidity, um, was really difficult. Um, but it was important for me to to really inhabit the space, um, to be there, and to take that time. The process of having to take this, you know, to put everything together and 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 to, and, and to make the the exposure itself. It, it's 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 not as simple as just hitting a button. Um, but that really gave me the opportunity to really kind of meditate, um, think about, you know, um, the space, um, and also to really feel a connection to the past in a way that I don't think I ever would have if I went there with a the digital camera. And I'm starting to mix pictures um, of my family here uh, with this work also. This is my grandmother in Stockton. Um, she's nearly 90. She was the first, I, she was the same, you know, this was 10 years ago from the first photograph I showed. Um, and she has no desire to go back to Cambodia. Um, she's, um, you know, someone who's had a very difficult life, um, but she's a matriarch of, of the family. Um, yeah. And this is my grandfather also in Stockton. He's unfortunately, he's starting to, 
we don't know how much more how much time he has. He's in his late eighties, um, and he also built a house in in um, in Cambodia. This is in Ban Bong. Um, it's a famous tourist site now. Um, and so there's a bat cave. These are bats that are flying. And, and this is actually the, the site, or I'm sorry, the, um, what my mother would have seen every single day when she was in labor camp. So she was in a child labor camp right there at that spot. Um, and she would see these bats fly every single night. Um, feeding, they, they, there's a million bats. I mean, it's just like, like 45 minutes of, of just this long stream of bats. Um, and uh, she was probably about 12 years old then herself, but you know, this is something that she saw. And now it's the tourist side. There's a bunch of tourists there. Um, it was strange for me to be there, you know, with my camera and to be, you know, next to a bunch of people who were there kind of vacationing or, or exploring. Um, but it's just for me to think of, you know, my mother um, being so young and, and, and seeing this and, um, you know, it was really, really, it was difficult for me to, 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 to process, but um, I was really grateful to, to have that. These are family that I, um, uncle um, that I just met. Um, he rode my mother to school every day um, on his bike. Um, they actually live next door to the family compound and they're still there now. This is uh, literally the woman who took care of my father and his siblings. And um, I found her through literally, I mean, a lot of these photographs um, involved literally just, just roaming, you know, asking people, um, do you know this person? You know, do you know someone in my family, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this was in Bai Lin, which is on the border. It was actually the Khmer Rouge stronghold during the war. Um, that was where the Khmer Rouge um, had their, their um, uh, bases um, after the genocide too. That's kind of where they kept the garrisons. But um, I was looking for where my father's house would have been. Um, and I asked around and no one knew, no one, because everyone there in Bai Lin are, are relatively new to the city. Uh, most of the people who lived there before the war or during the war um, either died or, or left. Um, but long story short, after many hours of, of walking around asking people, I was led to this woman that someone told me, oh, there's this woman, she's a fishmonger. Well, she was a fishmonger during the war and, and she, you know, she would know who your family is. And um, so I get there and she's like about 20 minutes away from, from the city. Um, she lives lives alone in like this rural house. Um, and she ended up being this, she, she was the woman that took care of my father. She knew everyone in my family. Um, you know, she knew my, my, they just, she, she just asked about it and she hadn't seen anyone since the war. Um, so it was kind of this amazing kind of connection. This is the, the same where the bats where you can probably see kind of at the, the top of the mountain, probably top, Right, there's a little, there's a cave and that's where the bats come out. Um, and this is the same area where my, my mother um, was during, during the war. Um, at the very top, there's a famous temple. Um, and during the Cambodian New Year, which is April, like just, just passed, is the largest um, holiday for Cambodians. Um, the big New Year celebration for the province was up on top of this mountain. Um, so my mother also had these really fond memories of, of, of celebrating the new year um, at the top of this mountain. And, you know, of course she was down in the labor camp um, working every single day. Um, and she would look up the mountain kind of, of longingly, you know, and um, I just, just the, the, the juxtaposition of, of, of those experiences were just kind of really, really blew my mind. Um, these I don't these people there's someone built a flower garden there and they charge 25 cents to come um and I just kind of sat there and waited and people came and, and I was able to make this photograph so this is another um kind of where um uh of, of me literally walking around asking you know do you, have you, do you know this person? Do you know this person? And I was looking for where my aunt on my mother's side, um, she was the woman that was in the center of the very first photograph that showed the family photograph that 
um, that was buried by my family, um, where she and her family were last before she was killed. Um, and we knew that it was around this, this temple area. Um, and then I found someone who was a lot older and they, they were able to, to kind of give me an idea of, of where they kept people. Um, but it is now a, um, it's a temple and a school. Um, a lot of temples are also schools in, in, in Cambodia. So, you know, these kids were playing soccer and I just thought it was, was so poetic. She was unfortunately um, killed with her, with her newborn or um, her, her infant. Yeah, this someone is my, in my, the chat has yeah. asked, how do your relatives and other people feel about judging of the past? Yeah, it's, you know, so, and it's um, for the longest time within the Cambodian community here, I think it was a bit, uh, when I started this work, there was both, you know, um, uh, there was support and there was pushback within the community, to say the least. Um, not amongst my family, um, but, um, you know, a lot of these conversations, at least within, um, amongst Cambodians, um, didn't really happen kind of collectively, right? So, I mean, re bear in mind that the, so the, the, the genocide tribunals in Cambodia that, that um, the longest, most expensive, you know, worst, I mean, more expensive than Nuremberg, just literally um, labeled it a genocide like last year, I believe. Um, so the point being though, that there's really been no justice, right? There's been, there's been really, and, and collectively um, amongst Cambodians, there hasn't been much of a collective conversation about, about the past. Um, amongst my family, it, you know, so, I mean, my mother's side, they are very, very, very supportive and they totally understand, but they, at first they were kind of, they didn't really, and like it, it didn't really make any sense to them why I was kind of so driven to do this work. Um, there's a sense that you want to keep on moving forward, you know, and, and you don't want to look back. And, and, and I, I, I understand that. Um, it was difficult, you know, when I was there on a lot of these sites, I was also in conversation with family members, um, with my mother even, you know, back in the States via, you know, Facebook and stuff. And, and it was difficult for her you know, um, to know that I was there in these sites too. So um, I do believe that this is a conversation that has to happen in one way or another. Um, and I feel this really strong sense of responsibility um, that the generation that comes after um, kind of shoulders a lot of that burden. Um, because we're not directly affected, but our parents and, 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 and you know, family members um, live through that, but they themselves don't have, um, you know, the ability to talk about, to, to articulate that experience. Um, so I, I do feel that, that, that responsibility. And I think that's something that, that is shared amongst other communities, other people, you know, with similar experiences, the sense that, you know, um, that we do, you know, we have this responsibility for sure. Yeah. I think that's a great point, um, considering, you know, intergen inter intergenerational trauma, like this is, this is recent history, um, what okay. your parents went through and what the people of Cambodia went through. It's not history that's 50 or 60 years old that, you know, like Absolutely. maybe some of our grandparents have memories of fighting in a war or something like that. Um, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's very yeah, and, and you know, we have to remember that it's a contested space is always a contested space. Right. So there, there it's, and it, for, for every, you know, community we have to look for, I mean, you know, amongst the Jewish community in the fifties, American Jews, it was a contested space in regards to the, you know, um, the, the, the memory of the Holocaust. Um, I, you know, I, I, I believe that, that, look, I mean, the reality is that I learned about the killing fields from the movie, The Killing Fields, when I was a kid, not from my family, right? And initially, right, when I was younger. Um, and as I got older, um, I learned via Google and YouTube and things like that. And then that brought me on a whole different path. But the point being, though, that a lot of those 
um, narratives were written by non-Cambodians. So I felt this need to, you know, to, to, to kind of to, 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 to do that because I think it's important that it comes from Cambodians. I think it's important that it comes from people who, who you know, who have lived through this experience or, or, or the, you know, the, the generation that came right after um, to be able to articulate what that means. And the reality is that like Cambodia is not a country that, that has, you know, resolved itself from this conflict. I mean, the scars are, avail are still there. They still linger and the scars still linger amongst families, you know, amongst communities here in the States also. Um, a lot of this work does come from outside of Cambodia because in Cambodia, um, these conversations are not happening. To, in, in the yeah, larger extent, like, right? I mean, that's, um, yeah. No, go I'm ahead. Sorry, I'm yes. sorry. I thought you were done. <laughs> it's Sarah. Yeah, you know, but please, you... please, please. Oh, I was just saying that um, my sister is Cambodian and she was adopted in our family because of the war. And um, even with her being in our family, I learned about the genocide through the killing fields. Right. And so yeah. I think that um, the work that you're doing is really important because like you said, there are so many people that are affected by this genocide that are, don't feel the support or don't feel the support to be able to articulate it. But I don't think you can, because my sister doesn't talk about it, but I don't think you can um, heal from extreme trauma without being able to talk about it. So I think the work is really important and I think the work, um, you know, about Cambodians in Cambodia and in the United States, I mean, I think it's really beautiful to see the two spaces together because they're really not separate in the hearts of the people, even if they right. don't right. know what Cambodia looks like. Right. And, you know, for me, I'm, I'm always, my entire life, I'm an insider and an outsider, always at the same time. I'm as an American, as a Cambodian. Um, and, you know, this comes with the, these conflicting identities um, as part of, you know, of, of my identity very much so. Um, so to be in Cambodia, I mean, people don't, they know that I'm not Cambodian, right? They just, they can look at me and know that I'm not, not Cambodian. Um, and um, so that, that was, it was interesting for me because I was able to be on both sides, right? I was able to get into spaces or to do things that if I was Cambodian, I probably would not have been able to. Um, and so I, I find that to be also really, really fascinating, right? To be both an insider and outsider and what that means as a photographer, right? So to be behind the lens, to have that, that the mediation of that space through a camera, um, it's it's something I think about you know quite regularly um, and something also I don't really yet know how to articulate you know um, in in photographs. This is my brother. Actually, I'm gonna go back to this is my sister. I'm sorry that I met for the first time. Um, so my father remarried and um, has um, two kids um, that he raised um, and when it was when I met my sister, it was kind of so you know there's there's multiple things in, in this story, I mean, these photographs is beyond just, you know, the, the Cambodian experience is also my personal family experience too. And um, when I met my sister, it was this really powerful connection in the sense that, wow, here's someone who grew up under the same person, right? Who shared that experience and who probably knows, you know, that in a way that no one else does in the world, um, irrespective of the fact that we grew up on, you know, both in, in, in complete opposite sides of the world. Um, so it was really an, an amazing, you know, um, connection that I felt with her. Um, and she has this deep sadness in her eyes that, you know, that, that I just, it, it, um, it comes from that experience, I believe with my father and, 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 and her life there. But when, when we first met, um, I, so my Khmer is okay, but I'm unable to articulate, you know, like deep feelings and thoughts and stuff in a way I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to, I can't speak Khmer that fluently. So I wasn't able to actually speak to her. 
and, and to articulate to her the things that I really just wanted to say. So I had a friend who via Facebook audio kind of translated and we had this conversation of both of us crying for an hour, you know, and me just, just telling her about, you know, why it had been so long for me to get there and, 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 and how it was like growing up with my father. I sat on her telling me the same and, and it was just such a, uh, an amazing experience. This is my my brother. He's so my sister's twenty and and he's he's sixteen. Um, is amazing in Cambodia. Everyone's got iPhones. Everyone's on Facebook. Everyone's connected online. Um, everyone's watching YouTube. Um, and yeah. this is uh, in Thailand, the, the refugee camp that I was born in, Khao Dam. Um, it was important for me to also go there and to see that space because it was such a, um, so for all Cambodian Americans, um, all Cambodians who were resettled in the West, they went through this refugee camp, Khao Dang, and it was kind of a foundational refugee camp for UNHCR. Um, I believe the guidebook for how to create a refugee camp in the middle of, of, of conflict came out of, of that experience. Um, at its peak, it was about 150,000 people. So it was a city that only exists now in the memories of those who live there because now it's just a forest and there's nothing left. Um, but this is actually, so it's a replica of Angkor Wat. Angkor Wat, if you're familiar, is the largest religious site in the world and it's a symbol of Cambodian nationalism and, and, and identity. Um, and it's an incomplete replica of Angkor Wat that was just abandoned in the jungle in, in, in this refugee camp. This is actually the very last picture I took in Cambodia, and and they're they're literally they're they're, they're digging my father's grave, um, and my dad's death was always something that was in the back of my mind growing up. Um, so on the last day that I was there, I went there to say bye, and he told me literally he's like, "Oh, they're digging my grave," and it was about two hours away, and I was like, "Whoa, wait!" So I literally jumped on a moto, I rode there as quickly as I could, and um, you know, took this was like high noon. Um, I had two sheets of film left, literally, and, and I, I made this photograph. Hey, I have another question for you. Yes, yes. <laughs> I know you're probably so far from imagining, I mean, maybe you're not, I guess I'm projecting. I would be very far from imagining what this final work would look like. Um, yeah. But do you do you have any visions for that? Like, does this need? Do you see this as like a book? Because obviously, the stories and the narratives are really exactly. important to, exactly. to convey. And um, exactly. so just a little more about that, yeah. Yeah. So you know, one one of the big difficulties that I have, and, and you can probably, you know, um, tell that it's um, the narrative is really is critical for me, and and it's hard to you know um, the photographs can't by themselves do justice, right? Um, so the photographs themselves can't, um, I do need text for sure. Um, I'd like, I'd, I'd like to make it into a book for sure. Um, I, I have been writing for, for individual, um, photographs, more kind of first person. Um, but yeah, I would love, love a book. Um, I'm, I'm expecting, um, first, um, firstborn. Um, my wife and I are, she's eight months pregnant. So we're expecting um, a son in June. Uh, very, very, very soon. Um, Congratulations. So, thank you. So when I talk about intergenerational, you know, I, it's, it's natural for me, it just feels natural for me to continue this to photograph my son. Um, so that's one way that I'm imagining how I can connect, um, you know, my personal narrative in my life and, and, and generationally to Cambodia also. Um, but then there's a lot more stuff, like a lot of, the difficulty that I have, and I would love, you know, um, a conversation on this too with with um, uh, with, with with everyone, um, is you know, like there's this degree of poetry that needs to be conveyed through images, right? That you need, you know, the pictures that work for me aren't images that hit you in the face that tell you what you need to see. They leave a sense of, you know, they're not complete. There's this like kind of you know, it's not fully resolved. Um, and I'm not yet making those pictures with this project. So that's where 
it needs to go. Because, you know, for example, for this photograph here, this is a pretty straightforward image. A lot of pictures I've shown are just matter of fact. And the reason for that is because for these trips that I made to Cambodia, it was important for me to go to these very specific sites, to find the sites and to make pictures in those specific places. I don't yet know how to open that up. Um, so that's something that, you know, the next in, in, in the years ahead that I'm, I'm, I'm going to experiment with. But yeah, book um, would, be, would be the best format for sure. So <clears throat> Pete, um, um, I love the fact that you're interweaving um, pictures like this and the more poetic pictures and the pictures from Cambodia and your family here in the United States. And I love the idea of incorporating pictures of your, of your um, son on the way and congratulations. Thank you. Um, and I'm excited to hear about it as a book, but <clears throat> not but, period. Yeah. One thing that I'm, I mean, at least PPAC has been thinking about especially like in the space where we are tonight is um, how um, we can sh have a more global or more engaged audience or a larger audience um, mm -hmm. on the online platform. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering, have you, probably you haven't thought about it because you're expecting and uh, you just moved, but I wonder if there's a way to authentically and mm. oh, especially put it online in a way that, you know, um, doesn't, um, doesn't, you know, sometimes online it feels like things are just, the content is just, you know, it's, it's little videos and things that are just flippish. But this content and your work is very um, sincere and emotional and important. So I'm just wondering, it would be interesting to think about how it could exist online in that capacity. Right. right, absolutely. I mean, you know, so as a creator, one of the, and it's everyone, um, one of the, the difficulties with online too is the sense that, you know, for any platform or anything you put online, it, it, it does require I mean, there's, you know, it, it depends on what it is, right? So when, when I first did the workshops that I, that I showed earlier, the idea of initially was to put that all online and to have some sort of an ability for people to contribute digitally online. There's been many, many projects like that, right? Um, the difficulty with those things is just to sustain it over time, funding it over time, you know, um, because it's something that, that, that lives and continues to evolve. Um, so I, I would love, would, would love that. Um, and I'd love, love to be able to figure out, you know, how to do that sustainably, how to create something, you know, that, that, um, yeah, that can live. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, it costs money bandwidth costs money, um, you know, web hosting costs money, um, all that. So absolutely though. Yes, I, I agree. I mean, it, it makes me think about the first project that you, sh that you showed us <clears throat> by connecting family stories together. And so um, it'd be amazing to see it on a larger scale and you can't really do it on a larger scale in a physical form, but it's right. interesting to think about it in a vir virtual form. Absolutely. And you know, one of the to things that I was, that, yes. Just to counter that thought a little bit too, I like, um, I think when you're going through your work, I think about the the family photo album and how yeah. like, you know, most Cambodians don't have one because a lot of right. the imagery was destroyed. That's right, exactly. Um, and so like how important it is to recreate that maybe physical object mm. as well. Mm, and I also just want to quickly read two comments from the chat and then remind everyone that we have about seven minutes left. Okay. Um, sounds like the next generation will be pertinent to the work looking through your son's eyes may help the words come from the project, come for the project, says Emily. And then Holly says, this may be off the exact topic, but I think that the photo of your father in bed with the terrible sadness in his eyes is very powerful and definitely makes me wish I knew more about him. Mm. Well, that's a good, that's a, um, so this is my father also, and um, he's doing his daily um, ointment routine for his psoriasis and, um, that's the, the ointment is so evocative, the smell. When I first smelled it, when I was there, you know, with them, um, it brought me right back to my childhood. You know, it, 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 it was, it was it like completely transported. And um, yeah, so this is, you know, he, he, 
had to be vulnerable to allow me to photograph him like this. Um, when I was growing up with him, he was deeply depressed, but he covered up everything because he didn't want anyone to see um, his skin. Um, so, you know, to be able to, to allow me to take this picture um, after having been, you know, the part for so long, um, it definitely um, was so grateful. And that's the, his, his ointment jar, actually. And that's actually a light leak for my, my wooden camera, but it just, it kind of was perfect. I'm just going to go through these really quick because we have a couple more minutes. Um, this is where my grandfather was executed. Um, he would have been, he would have been dropped into this cave. Um, and this is the, the inside of, of the cave. Um, you can see steps. Um, this is where the Khmer Rouge executed people in Ban Bang in the province where my family was at. There's actually another cave to the left of it for children. Um, and I mean, it's, it's, it's just brutal, it's horrific. And I wanted to end on this. So this is, um, there's, you can barely see it, but to the, to, in, in, there's a, a ditch there and that was dug by my family. That was the labor camp that they were in. Um, and, you know, so I had to find this site and, and, and go there and, and wait um, to make this photograph. But my mother, when she, when she was there, um, as she, people were moved around multiple different sites. And, and so this is. It looks like we lost Pete. Yeah, I think the storms are affecting <clears throat> the East Coast right now a bit. Well, let's wait for a minute to, for him to come back. Um, he should be able to, to come back. Does anybody... Um, um, have anything they want to share? while we wait for Pete to come back. Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit while we wait? Yes, I would love to. Um, I mean, I said what I said earlier, but I, I'm just really thankful for everyone being here tonight. It's really wonderful to connect in this way and to um, see and hear everybody right now. Um, and I can't thank you enough for your support and being part of PPAC. And I'm going to stop because Pete's back. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry, my computer just crashed. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. I'm not going to open Lightroom, crashed my computer a moment ago. So I'm not going to go back to that picture. But that, that last photograph, it was my mother used these tamarind trees to guide her when she escaped to go find my mother. So, um, you know, I, I'm sorry, to find her own mother. Um, so it, yeah, just, you know, for me again, to, to find that, to be there and inhabit that space was, was really, really, really important. Sorry um, about that. No, it's no problem. I, I also got shut out. Um, Carol Thompson has a question. Carol, do you want to ask it in person? Um, if you do, uh, it'd be great if you could. Yeah, there you are. Go for it. Hi, Pete. Um, I wondered, especially since you said that your experience with, with the large format camera was new, whether you found that it was a barrier to, uh, to the people you were photographing, whether it felt like a barrier to you or a safe space, how did you manage this object? Yeah, so that's really great. You know, um, it was a barrier in the sense that I was only able to make certain pictures, right? There are a lot of pictures that I wasn't able to make because just the nature of, of, of the camera. But then it's also, you know, it, it created a barrier for me and everyone else because here I am behind the dark cloth with the loop, you know, focusing and, and I'm literally not visible. Um, so definitely, you know, but then at the same time, everyone, as you probably know, if you ever shot with a camera that's non-conventional, people are so interested in, in, in the camera um, and people, you know, kind of open up in a way that they generally probably want if you just showed up with a digital camera. Yeah. But it also, you know, again, as I mentioned before, created the space for me um, 
in a sense of, you know, in, in, in being there and there, but then also by not having the ability to see any of the pictures until literally about eight months after or so, gave me another opportunity to revisit that experience. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have um, a question for Peter or a comment? Um, you can unmute yourself if you want to speak. Um, go ahead. I have a question. Hello. I'm just um, like practically getting around with yeah. all of that gear. I was wondering how how that worked. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it's literally it's 100 degrees there, and you know, I'm I I there are many times that I nearly fainted from the heat, and I'm just not used to it, right? Um, I had a, a camera bag. So if you guys, if you, if you ever, um, they're called Atlas bags, I believe Atlas adventure bags. It's like a big backpack. It feels like a regular, it's a real like backpacking backpack, but it's made for large format cameras and, um, and like large gear. Um, so it, that was, I was able to walk around with that for sure. But, um, I, I had it, I wrote, I learned how to ride a moto when I was there. I'd never ridden a moto before. There you ride a moto off road everywhere. It's just, it's, you know, and so I had this backpack on me the whole time. And I, I, you know, so some of these images I made, I literally wrote this moto to make sunset, to make a photograph, you know, two hours in, you know, take everything apart, 10 minutes to make a photograph, put it back together and then ride two hours back, you know. But uh, yeah, Emily, that was a lot, a lot, yeah. Emily, do you have a question? Um, well, just a comment really. Can, can you hear me? I think I unmuted myself. Yes. Um, no, yes. I'm just, I, I'm thrilled to see this kind of work. I'm doing something similar myself. And I think that the family connection with events like that, that everybody knows about is an amazingly personal and wonderful entry into um, knowing about it in, in a way that we can't know otherwise. So mostly I just, I'm just congratulating you and, and urging you on. So yeah, thank you. Great. Um, anybody else would like to ask Pete a question or comment? You can just unmute and jump in. Okay, I have one more question. Pete, when I was in Cambodia a couple of years ago, the theme of water was mm. very yeah. important because Absolutely. the schools had no safe sewers, mm. getting access to water was very right. difficult and you're surrounded by water and it's so right. beautiful. Um, I wondered if you found that to be part of the story or, yeah. or not. Yeah, so the rivers. So, you know, water is integral to Cambodian identity and the Cambodian civilization, right? So the um, 10th, 11th century um, Cambodia was you know, recent LIDAR analysis through NASA and others shown that, you know, the Angkor Wat area was home to nearly a million people, you know, um, and all of that was via water, the monsoons that fed, you know, such a large amount of people. Um, but water in the sense of, of rebirth, you know, um, every single year, the, the monsoon comes and brings back life. Um, water in the sense of, you know, the rivers that, you know, my mother grew up near and uh, my father and stuff. So yeah, um, it, it, actually a lot of the pictures were of water to the sense that, you know, I was even considering kind of focusing on that as a kind of a motif for, um, for the images, for sure. Thank you. I, I think that, you know, we've gone a little bit over eight o'clock, um, but we started a little late. So if there's one more question, um, we should, uh, I'd love for, to hear from one more person if anybody has anything more to say. You've gotten lots of love in the chat box, right. Pete. Yeah, I was going to say, everyone's loving your work and thanking you for being here. And um, we thank you for being here. And we thank all of you for being here. And um, it's so fantastic to see our community together. And um, 
I can't thank you enough for your support of PPAC during this time. And we look forward to seeing more from Pete. And if there's any way that we can um, help disseminate your work or talk about your work or further the conversation, like we're totally into it. So it was a thank pleasure you. having you as a yeah. artist in resident. I have to say that I think Keith, who's in charge of our lab said you put the most miles on our scanner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's, it's still standing. Um, so, so it's all good. So thank you everyone. And um, we have another talk next Thursday. We have lots of classes online and um, we couldn't do all of this without your support. So considering supporting PPAC um, in multiple ways, whether through being through funds or through sharing our information to your contact list. Um, we will all get through this together if we all support each other. And so collaboration and partnership and community it is, uh, has always been important, um, but it's more important now through a time of crisis. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Let us know about the baby. <laughs> yes, yes, soon, very, very soon. It's a crazy, crazy time. And again, I hope everyone stays well, safe um, and healthy. Um, thank you guys for, for, um, for being a part of this. And, and thank you, PPAC. Again, I can't, I can't thank you enough. Everyone there, um, so instrumental um, for realizing this, this work for me. So I just, yeah, I'm so grateful. Thank you. Good night, everyone. See you next Thursday. Good night. Have a lovely weekend. Stay safe and healthy and positive and creative. Yes. <laughs>